Shalom, and welcome to another edition of The Truth Shall Make You Free. I'm your host, Elder Nathaniel, on my right, Deacon Asaph. Today's topic is three trials of faith. But before we begin, let's open up with John 8, verse 32. John chapter 8, verse 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. So black man, Latin man, black woman, and Latin woman, if you want to be set free from captivity, you must accept the truth that you are an Israelite, and Christ died for you, and only you, and is returning to deliver you from your slave masters. So now, let's go to Luke chapter 4 and verse 13. Because what happens is a lot of you are starting to wake up. Brothers and sisters, you're starting to wake up, and we give all praises to the Most High. But you all have questions. Okay, now that I know I'm an Israelite, now what must I do? What's going to happen from now? Where do we go from here? I'm going to show you something. Luke chapter 4 verse 13. Watch this. Luke chapter 4 verse 13. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. I want you to understand that last part, for a season. Christ was tempted over and over, okay? Temptations come, temptations go. That's what you're all going to find out in your life. From there, let's go to Ecclesiasticus in the Apocrypha, chapter 2 and verse 1. This is something all of you need to understand, brothers and sisters. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 2 and verse 1. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 2, verse 1. Listen good. My son, if thou come to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. My son, when you come to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. What does that let you know? That when you come into this truth, you're waking up that you are Israelite, a son, a daughter of the Most High? It says prepare your soul for temptation. That's why in Luke 4 verse 13, it said, And after Satan had ended all his temptation, he departed from Christ for a season. Meaning what? I'll be back. Meaning he was going to come back and to begin the temptation all over again. Let's go from there. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. And let's start at verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4. All we want is verse 12 through 16. That's it. Okay? 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 12. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial which is to try you. And though some strange thing happened unto you. Read that part again. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial. That's another term for temptation, a fiery trial. Come on. Beloved, think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you. Which is to try you. Which is to try you. Come on. As though some strange thing happened unto you. As though some strange thing happened to you. You come into this truth. Things is going wrong in your life. You're like, well, what's going on? I, I realize I'm an Israelite. What's going on in my life now? I never had these problems before. Why am I going through this now? Come on. But rejoice. But what? But rejoice. Come on. And as much as ye are partakers of Christ's suffering. As much as you are partakers of Christ's suffering. Read. That when his glory shall be revealed, mm -hmm. ye may be glad also with exceeding joy. What verse is that? 13. We're going to read down to 16. Go ahead. If you be reproached for the name of Christ. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, you come into this truth and you get all obstacles, trials against you because of this truth. Come on. If you be reproached for the name of Christ, happy are ye. For the spirit of glory and of God resteth upon you. Come on. On their part, he is evil spoken of. On their part, he is evil spoken of. It might be your mother, your father, your husband, your wife. You come into this truth, oh, you're some Israelite now. Now you're keeping the commandments, and they got plagues. That's what you hear. Oh, you don't keep Christmas no more? Oh, come on. That's the time we all get together. You hear afflictions, verbal afflictions. Come on. On their part, he is evil spoken of, but on your part, he is glorified. Come on. But let none of you suffer as a murderer. But now it says now, that's normal when you come into the truth. But it comes back, Peter says, but let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or a thief or as an evil doer or as an evil doer. Don't come in as truth and you've not repented of your sins, okay? You're making it, oh yeah, I'm an Israelite, but you're still a thief. You're still a liar. Drug you're dealer. A drug dealer, a prostitute. No, you should not be like that. Come on. Or as a busybody in other men's matters. And you, mainly you sisters, don't come in this truth being busybodies 
all in the business in every man's affairs. Come on. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on his on this behalf. Now don't get confounded by the term Christian. There. Hold that. Give me Acts 11 verse 26. Acts 11 verse 26. Because now you go, what? Christian? I thought we Israel. We are Israelites, but I'm going to show you something. What's the origin behind this word Christian? It shows you right here. Acts 11 verse 26. Come on. And we had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church. Watch this. And taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And the disciples, and the disciples, and the disciples were first called Christian at Antioch. That term Christian means what? Anointed. That's what it means. Who was called the anointed? The Israelites that followed Christ. Understand that. Let's go back. What, back to 1 Peter 4. What verse you into that? Verse Peter 4, verse 16. Go ahead. Yet if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God on this behalf. This, that was 16. Right. Okay, from there, let's go to Leviticus 19, verse 17 and 18. Leviticus 19, verse 17 and 18. Come on. Leviticus 19, verse 17. Thou shalt not hate thy brother in thine heart. So ne next thing I need all of you brothers and sisters to understand, the law says thou shalt not hate your brother in your heart, meaning your mind, come on. Thou shalt in any wise rebuke thy neighbor. Meaning thou shalt in any wise correct your neighbor according to the law. Go ahead. And not suffer sin upon him. Because by you correcting one another, you would not suffer sin upon one another. What does that mean? Meaning what? You show that's the ultimate love you got one for another. You see a brother or sister going off, you're going to correct them in the laws of the Most High. Read. Thou shalt not avenge nor bear any grudge against the children of thy people. Come on. But thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. What verse is that? Verse 18. That's it? Yeah. Now from there, let's go to Ecclesi let's go back to Ecclesiastes 2. We're going right back to the Apocrypha. I need you all to get your pens, papers, your Bibles, your Apocryphas. And take notes, careful notes. Now watch this. We read this already. Let's read it again. Ecclesiastes chapter 2 verse 1. My son, if thou come to serve the Lord, prepare thy soul for temptation. Prepare thy soul for temptation. There's going to be three levels of temptation in everyone's life. You're going to have that personal temptation, that personal trial, that personal tribulation. Then you're going to have that marital trial, that marital tribulation, meaning that brother or sister that's married now. Okay? Then after that, you may start to gather together with believers. You're going to have that congregational trial, that congregational uh, tribulation, problems in the congregation. Understand that. Personal, marital, and congregational. Understand that. That's going to happen to you. It's going to. And it's going to explain why. Keep reading. Set thy heart aright and constantly endure. Set thy heart aright. Meaning what? Set your mind according to God's laws and constantly do what? And constantly endure. Meaning when these trials come your way, when it's tribulation, the temptations come your way, constantly endure. Come on. And make not haste in time of trouble. What does that mean, make not haste in time of trouble? Trials come your way, you're, oh, I'm leaving this truth. Because I never had that problem before when I was a nigga in the world. And you want to leave the truth? The Bible says no, don't make haste in time of trouble. Come on. Cleave unto him and depart not away that thou mayest be increased at thy last end. See that? That you may be increased at your last end. Like the prophet Job. Okay, remember, he was rich. Okay? Then Satan said to the Lord, let me try that man. And the Most High said, okay, you can try him. You can kill his kids. You can destroy his home. You can destroy his business. He said, you can even make him sick. But don't take his life. Remember that history in Job 1. Job chapter 1, verse chapter 1 through chapter 3. You yeah. can read about that. Come up. Whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully. Whatever is brought upon you, take cheerfully. Come on. And be patient when thou art changed to a lower state. And be patient when you are changed to a lower state. Because a lot of time, brothers and sisters, you come into this truth. You might have been that Nicodemus, that Joseph of Arimathea, who had riches, who had fame and fortune. But when you come into this truth, you notice Satan's attacking you now from all sides. You might lose that wealth you once had. You might lose that fame you once had. But read that again. Whatsoever is brought upon thee, take cheerfully. And be patient when thou art changed to a lower state. Be patient when you are changed to a lower state. Watch this. For gold is tried in the fire. See that? For gold is... The word for means what? Because. 
because gold is tried in the fire. So who's the gold? You're the gold. You are the gold that's tried in the fire. Let's examine this. Let's get the analogy here of gold. When people do mining and they get gold from uh, the earth, what do they do to refine that gold? They melt it down. Why? Because inside every piece of gold, before it's refined, there might be pieces of iron, pieces of steel, rock, tin, all kind of other elements that's not needful. So it has to be melted down to take out all the impurities. So you, you're that gold. God must melt your life. He must break you down. Why? To get the impurities out of you. What's the impurities that's in you? Sin. Some of you might have been liars all your life, thieves, prostitutes, pimps, whoremongers. So the Most High God has to break your life down. Why? To get all, so that you can see the impurities in you. Because a lot of you don't know yourself. So when the Most High humbles you, he breaks your life down to the basic elements. Now you say, well, whoa, I didn't know I was like that. Now you see what's wrong with you. And you realize you got to change that part of you. Take that sin out of you. Read that again. For gold is tried in the fire, and acceptable men in the furnace of adversity. An acceptable men in a furnace of adversity. You got brothers that say, yo, I'm down with you. I'm down in this truth. But then as soon as adversity comes, how do you know if a brother's down for the cause? When adversity comes. Because if he's not down, it's going to be revealed. He ain't for this truth. He or she going to leave. Soon as adversity comes, you go, nah, brother. Nah, sister. You was never sincere in this truth. Because soon as a little hell comes your way, you out the door. Some of you brothers back under your wife's skirt, under your mama's skirt. Got a quarter cow? Call my mama. I didn't know this things were going to happen. That's what happens. So in order to prove you, to prove that you're acceptable, the Most High must put you in the furnace of adversity. That's what he did with Job. And when you read the history of Job, it said he never cursed the Most High. He stood true to the faith. Read on. What verse you at? Verse 6. Come on. Believe in him, and he will help thee. Believe in him, and he will help thee. Read. Order thy way aright, and trust in him. Order thy way aright, and trust in the Lord. Come on. Ye that fear the Lord, wait for his mercy. Ye that fear the Lord. Why does it say wait for his mercy? Because it says weeping. May endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. Read that again. Ye that fear the Lord, wait for his mercy. You got to wait for the Lord's mercy. No matter what comes your way, be patient and wait for his mercy. Read. And go not aside, lest he fall. And go not aside, lest you fall. What does that mean, go not aside? Don't go aside from the Most High's commandments. Don't go aside from the Most High's laws. Read. Ye that fear the Lord, believe him. And your reward shall not fail. You see that? Ye that believe the Lord. What does it say? Ye that fear the Lord. Believe him. Believe him. And your reward shall not fail. And your reward shall not fail. What's the reward we all want? We want salvation. We want liberation. We want a kingdom upon the earth. That's what we want. So it said, read it again. Ye that fear the Lord. Believe him. And your reward shall not fail. Our reward shall not fail. Read. Ye that fear the Lord. Hope for good. Hope for what? Hope for good. Come on. And for everlasting joy and mercy. And for everlasting joy and mercy. What verse you at? Verse 9. Go ahead. Look at the generations of old. Now listen see. good, brothers and sisters. Listen good to this part. Read it again. Look at the generations of old and see. Look at the generations of old. Look at your father, forefather. Look at Adam. Look at Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Look at David. Look at Solomon. Look at Isaiah. Look at Ezekiel. Look at Christ. Look at uh, Peter and Paul. Okay, and, and James and John. Read that again. Look at the generations of old and see. Mm -hmm. Did ever any trust in the Lord? Did and any of our forefathers trust in the Lord? And, and was confounded? And was confounded? Did the Most High just go, oh, I'm giving this nigga up. Ah, they trusted me. <laughs> that never happened. Read it again. Look at the generations of old and see. Did ever any trust in the Lord and was confounded? Even our sisters, our foremothers. Look at Sarah. Look at Rebecca. Look at Esther. Look at Judith. Look at Deborah. Okay, look at Mary. Look at Martha. Read it again. Look at, all, at the generations of old and see. Did any trust in the Lord and was confounded? Did the Most High confound any of them that trusted in him? The answer is no. He never put none of them to shame. Go ahead. Or did any abide in his fear and was forsaken? And was forsaken. Did the Most High forsake any of our four parents? No. What verse is that? Verse 10. You finished 10? No. Go ahead. Or whom did he ever despise that called upon him? Who did the Lord ever despise that called upon his name? That did what is required of him? 
Go ahead. For the Lord is full of compassion. Was that 10? That one was 10. Go ahead. Now from there, go to 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 13. I need you all to listen good. Because you come into this truth and you don't know what to expect. But the Most High is letting you know right now what to expect. In order for you, in order for him to make a man out of you, in order for him to make a woman out of you, you must go through the furnace of adversity. You must be tried. You must, he's going to allow Satan to tempt you on different levels. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 13. Mm -hmm. There are no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. Because some of you write us, some of you call us, and you go, ah, I'm going through something new, brother. This has never happened. No, 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 no. What you're going through is nothing new. Read it again. There are no temptation taking you, but such as is common to man. But such temptation as is common to man. Meaning there's brothers and his sisters who have gone through or are going through the same thing you're going through right now. Go ahead. But God is faithful. But God is faithful. Who will not suffer you to be tempted above all ye are able. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tempted above what you are able. Meaning, what does that mean? The Most High knows your breaking point. He knows that what comes your way, you're able to handle it. He knows you better than you know you. Okay? Was that it? All I want is 13. No, that's not it. But will, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. What is the way to escape when you're tried, when you're tempted? The word of the Most High. You got to humble down and search the scriptures, okay? You got to be around brothers and sisters that know the scriptures, who can guide you in the Bible to show you what scriptures say, what does the scriptures say about your life, what you're going through, okay? How to overcome it. You got brothers whose wives come in, this, they come in this truth and the wife goes, nigga, I'm leaving you! Some of you brothers come in this truth, your wife was of another nation. There's scriptures that deal with that too. We show you Ezra, we show you Nehemiah. When the Most High said, put them away. And you go, <laughs> but you got to do what the Bible says. That's your way to escape. Understand that, okay? From there, go to James chapter 1 and verse 1. Okay, so the Most High is going to make that man out of you. He's going to make that woman out of you. He's going to make an Israelite indeed out of you. And I. James chapter 1, let's, we want verse 1 through 4, and that's it. Come James on. chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. Notice it says, to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad. This Bible is not written to other nations. It's only written to the 12 tribes of Israel. Come up. Greeting, my brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptation. Read that again. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Meaning what? The Most High sees you acceptable. Satan's taught your names on Satan's lap. All right? The Most High says, listen, you can do this and you can do that, but spare his or her life. Read that again. Knowing this, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptation. Come on. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The there's a purpose behind the trials you're going through. There's a purpose behind the tribulation, behind the temptation. Read it again. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. It works patience. That's what all of us lack. We want the Lord to come now. That's what we say, right? You at home, you want the Lord to come now, right? But guess what? If the Lord comes now, are you ready? Or you might think you are, but guess what? You're not ready. Because within each of us, there's sin there that must be purged from us. So we got to learn patience to overcome the impurities in our minds. Okay? Read it again. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work. But let patience have a perfect work. Come on. That ye may be perfect. That you may what? That ye may be perfect. The purpose for the trial, for the temptation, is that you may become perfect. You can't become perfect like that with a snap of your finger. You got to go through some stuff. You got to go through some trials. You got to go through some tribulations to purge all the sin out of you so that you can see clear, so that you can understand with a pure mind, a sober mind. Come on. That ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. That you may be imperfect, that you may be perfect and what? And entire. And what? And entire. What does entire mean? It means whole. You might have one area of your life down packed. Like, for example, let's talk about the law, thou shalt not eat the swine. 
A lot of you got that down pat. You go, I ain't need no part. That, that ain't my issue. But what about um, adultery? What about that part of your life, huh? What about that spirit of a whoremonger? Have you purged? Has that been purged from you? Maybe that might not be your thing. Maybe it's covetousness. Maybe you got the thing of following the Joneses. Oh, look, uh, Josie got a new car, uh, and you want that, and you spending your last dime to follow Josie. Now you in a poor house, okay? There's different areas of your life that the Most High got to reveal to you, okay? Read it again. What verse you at? Verse 4. Come on. But let patience have perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. Wanting nothing meaning lacking nothing. We all lack. Coming out of a Negro state of mind, a Negro, Latino, a nigger state of mind, takes a lot of work for the Most High to bring us to the image of Christ. Because that's what we all trying to get to, that image, the mind of Christ. And we come, a lot of us, from a world of sin. You can't get rid of it like that, okay, because it's still in your mind. Okay, what verse you finished? That was 4. From there, let's go to Romans 5. We're coming back to James. Let's go to Romans 5 and 3. I want to show you something. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 to 5. That's all we want. Romans chapter 5, verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations Notice also. Notice it says that we glory in tribulation. Oh, that, now that's easier said than done, that we glory in tribulation. Paul says this because he understood in the spirit of Christ the purpose of tribulation. Read it again. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. Come on. Knowing that tribulations worketh patience. See what the purpose of tribulation is? Like it said in James, tribulation worketh patience. That's what we all lack. Like I keep saying, you want Christ to come back now? You want him to come back tomorrow? But guess what? You ain't ready. You ain't ready. We ain't ready yet. There's still a level of perfection we must attain to. Read it again. And not only, oh, oh, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation work is patience. Come on. And patience, experience. And experience, as you being tried in your tribulation, you're learning patience. And patience does what? And patience worketh experience. That patience worketh experience in you. Because a lot of you lack the understanding. A lot of you lack experience in how to deal with brothers and sisters, how to deal with family members, how to deal with yourself when it comes to sin. Okay? Come on. Experience hope. And experience as you, as you, as you have gone through your tribulation, it's building ex, uh, patience, which is building experience, which is building hope. Is that what it said? Yeah. Build hope. Because that shows you're able to counsel that brother or sister that comes in new to the faith. You've been there already. You've done that already. Now you're able to counsel them in the Bible, not on how you feel or what you think, because a lot of you are good for that. You've counseled people before, but it's always been on what you think. Let's counsel them what thus saith the Lord says now. Read that part again. And patience experience and experience hope. And hope maketh not ashamed. And hope maketh not ashamed. What verse is that? Five. That was it? You finished five? No. Go ahead. Because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. Now from there, go to Apocrypha, get Ecclesiasticus, chapter 1 and verse 23. We're still dealing with the three trials of, trials of faith, all right? We're still, right now I'm dealing with the personal level, okay? Ecclesiasticus, chapter 1, verse 23. Ecclesiasticus, chapter 1, verse 23. A patient man will bear for a time. See that? A patient man will bear for a time. And afterward, joy shall spring up unto him. And afterward, joy shall spring up unto him. So that patient man enduring for a time, he's enduring in whatever comes his or her way. And afterward, when the Most High deems it time for mercy, joy springs up. Understand that. From there, let's go back to James now. Let's go back to James chapter 1, and we're in verse 5 now. We're going to read verse 5 through 15. James chapter 1, verse 5 through 15. Okay? James chapter 1, verse 5. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask God. If any of you lack wisdom, a lot of you, a lot of us who coming out of that low Negro Latino state of mind, we lack wisdom. Let's call it straight. Let's call it what it is. We coming out of a dumb state of mind, okay? We coming out of a white man's frame of mind. Now it says, read it again. If any of you lack wisdom, we all lack wisdom. What should let we him do? ask of God. Let him ask of God. You got to fall on your knees and ask the Most High to open your understanding to this Bible. Go ahead. That giveth to all men liberally. That giveth to all men. All men is all Israelite men. What? 
that give it to all men liberally. Meaning freely, come on. And upbraideth not. Upbraideth not, come on. And it shall be given him. Read. But let him ask in faith. See, the, the point is you got to ask for wisdom in faith. You can't just say, oh, Lord, give me wisdom, and it's going to go, Pop! it don't come like that. It says you got to what? But let him ask in faith. Hold on. Give me Psalms 111, verse 10. You lack wisdom. You want wisdom. Okay? There's a starting point in order to get this wisdom. You got to show the most high your faith. Okay? Now watch this. Psalms 111, verse 10. Psalms 111, verse 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do his commandments. A good understanding have what? Have all they that do his commandments. Have all they that do, that do, that do his commandments. Okay? Let's go back to James now. What verse you were at? James chapter 1, verse 5. Come on. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Mm -hmm. But let him ask in faith. Nothing wavering. Nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea. He that wavereth is like what? It's like a wave of the sea. I don't know if he's going to do it for me. I'm going to ask him, but I'm not sure. Should I keep the commandments? I don't know if I should keep the commandments. Let me ask my grandmama. Let me ask my aunt. I don't know. Go ahead. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything right. of the Lord. A brother or sister like that, a wavering brother, I'm not sure. You run into T.D. Jakes on one side, then you run into the Israelites on the next. You're like a wave of the sea. You're not going to receive things from the Lord. Go ahead. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man. What does it mean, double-minded? One side you're for the truth. The other side you're not sure if it's the truth. You're double-minded. you got to take a stand on what this Bible says. Read. Let the brother of a low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Let the brother of a low degree. What verse is this? Verse 9. Let him rejoice in that he is exalted. Why is he going to be exalted? Because he is not double-minded. He's standing firm no matter what came his way. He said, I'm going to stay in this truth. Regardless if my wife left me, my kids left me, I lost my job, my house burned down, I'm staying firm in, his, in this truth. Read it again. Let the brother of a low degree rejoice in that he is exalted. Come on. But the rich in that he is made low, because as the flower of the grass he shall pass away. Come on. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withereth the grass and the flower thereof falleth. Because our lives is like grass, read. And the grace of the fashion of it perisheth, so also shall the rich man fade away in his way. What verse you at? Verse 11. Go ahead. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Now this is what we wanted to get to. Read it again. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Brothers and sisters, you must endure whatever tribulation comes your way. Just like we read in Luke 4.13, it said after Satan had tempted Christ for 40 days and 40 nights, he left Christ for a season. It says a season. Why? Because he was coming back to try him all over again. Read it again. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. Come on. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life. Read. Which the Lord hath promised to them that love The Lord has promised a crown to you Israelites if you endure the temptation. Okay, read. Let no man say when he is tempted. Watch this. I am tempted of God. Don't let none of you say God is tempting me. Why, why can't we say that? For God cannot be tempted with the evil. For God cannot be tempted with evil. That's why when you read Job chapter 1. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. And the Lord said unto Satan, Whence comest thou? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down it. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? See what the Most High said to the devil, to Satan, the spiritual demon. Have you considered my servant Job? Go ahead. That there is none like him in the earth? He said, my servant Job is bad. He's, 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 he's the pinnacle of perfection. Go ahead. A perfect and upright man, one that feareth God, and he sheweth evil. Now watch this. Then Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? Does, does Job fear you for no reason? Go ahead. Has not thou made an hedge about him? Look, you got angels all around him. You got wealth and all kind of things. This guy got everything. Go ahead. And about his house and about all he hath on every side, thou hast blessed the work of his hands. 
and his substance in the increase in the land. Come on. But put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. You see that? See, when they was talking about Job, he, Satan said, Listen, you got all these blessings around Job, but let me go in there and touch this guy. Let me touch him. The Lord said, go ahead, but don't take his life. Let's go back now to, to James. Where were you at? James chapter 1 and what verse? 15 was it? Or 12? Verse 12. Right, 12 again. Watch this. James chapter 1 verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised him to them that love him. Come on. Let no man say when he is tempted. Let no man say when he is tempted. I am tempted of God. I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. For God cannot be tempted with evil. See, it's not the Most High coming down doing this and doing that. The Most High has created Satan and those remnant of angels to do those things. For example, you got a lot of brothers. Some of you sisters recently, here's the new thing in the earth. God made me a faggot. God made me a homosexual. God made me a lesbian. Read that again. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil. Right. So the most high didn't do that to you. That's your why it's gonna say that. Read on. Neither tempted he any man. Here come. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. No, no, no. God made me a homosexual. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. God made me a crackhead. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. God made me a swine eater, a pork eater. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. God made me like to have sex with women on their menstrual cycle. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust. And entice. See that? You see where that spirit comes from? It comes from you. These are spirits within you that you didn't even know was in there. Now that you're hearing the scriptures, you're reading the scriptures, you reveal the most high is revealing to you all the sin within you. Okay? Read that again. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then when lust has conceived, then when lust has conceived, it bringeth forth sin. It brings forth sin. Why? Because you give in to that lust, that temptation. Go ahead. And sin when it is finished. And sin once you've done it over and over again, bringeth forth death. It brings forth death. Understand that. Okay. What verse is that? That was fifteen. That was fifteen. You finished fifteen. Yeah. Okay. So what we're showing you, brothers and sisters, hold on. Give me uh, 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 Romans seven. Romans chapter seven, verse seven. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? God forbid. Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. Paul said, I would not have known sin except by the laws of God. Go ahead. For I had not known lust, except the law had said, thou shalt not covet. So Paul says he would have never understood lust, except by him studying the scriptures, he came across the law that said, thou shalt not covet. See what the Lord does? It reveals the sin within you and I. That's what the Lord does. That's why you need the Lord. A Negro wrote us the other day, calling himself Elder something. He said, brother, I don't need the Lord because I'm perfect. Negro, please. You that pork-eating, child-molesting preacher that you always been, always after a dollar, that's you. The Lord's meant for all of us, brother. So if you got in your own dilapidated mind and you are perfect and you don't need the law, bye-bye. This ain't for you. Because Christ said, I didn't come for the righteous. I came for sinners, okay? And until you acknowledge that you're a sinner, this truth is not for you, okay? Now, from there, let's go to Matthew 19, verse 4. Okay, now we go, we're going to step just outside the personal level of temptation. Now we want to deal with that marriage, that marital form of temptation. Matthew 19, let's read verse 4 and 5. Matthew chapter 19, verse 4. And he answered and said unto them, Have ye not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Mm -hmm. And said, For this cause shall a man leave father and mother, and shall cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. They twain, meaning the husband and wife shall be one flesh. What verse was that? That was 5. Go ahead, from there, go to, give me the part in there that says what God has joined together. Wherefore they what are verse no, is it? Verse six. Go ahead. Wherefore they are no more twain but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. What God has joined together. What God has joined I want to pause right there. 
Because what God has joined together means that husband, that wife decided one with another, let's be married according to the laws of God. Let's come together as husband and wife, as Israelites, according to what the scriptures say. Okay? There's no, going to be no lying, no deceit, none of this. Uh, the, the husband says, he says to the woman, uh, let's get married. She says, yeah, let's get married. He says, well, listen, I'm, I'm, I'm clean. I have no diseases or anything. What about you? She goes, no, I'm clean. We're good. Let's do our prayers. And then a month later, she's in a bed crying. <laughs> he goes, baby, what's wrong? What's wrong? I got something to tell you. What is it, baby? I got you. What? What? I got the herpes. You got the herpes? You told me you was clean, sister. Well, I just lied to get you. See, that's not what God has joined together. I'm going to tell you straight. You brothers and sisters that get together and you manipulate somebody to become husband and wife, when that spouse finds out that you done lied to them, all holds up. You can't run to the scriptures now and say God joined you together. Why? Because you lied, you manipulated one the other, okay? So now, from there, 1 Corinthians 7. Let's go from there now. Let's get back to the marriage that does come together in the Lord. Let's deal with that brother or sister who, in sincerity, come together because they fear the Lord. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 28. Listen good. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 28. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. See, there's nothing wrong with getting married, brothers and sisters. It's, it's fine. It's a good thing. Come on. And if a virgin marry... She had not sinned. Come on. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. Read that again. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. Read it again. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. I want you to read that again for them. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh. Come on. But I spare you. What does he mean, I, but I spare you? Meaning Paul was warning you. Before you get married, I'm going to let you know something. You're going to have trouble in the flesh. Now that you have graduated from your personal temptation, now you're going to have temptation with that spouse you joined with. Because now you've got two minds trying to come together in the Lord. There's going to be trials and tribulations right there in the marriage. Read it again. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. Now let's go to Ephesians 5, verse 27. Ephesians 5. Watch this. Ephesians 5, let's start at 27. We're going to read down to 32. Now we're dealing with the second trial of your faith, which is that marriage moment, that mar marital. Come on. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 27. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but, that, but it should be holy and without blemish. What is he talking about? Jump up to verse 22 for us quick. Verse 22. Wives, submit yourselves unto your husband. Wives, you women that are married, submit yourselves to your own husbands. As unto the Lord. As unto who? As unto the Lord. As unto the Lord. So guess what, black man, Latin man? The, your role in the family is that of the Lord. I'm going to say it again. The role of the man is Christ in the home. Read it again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife. For what? For the husband is the head of the wife. You sisters understand that? You talk about you repenting. A lot of you women are stuck on Christianity because you read that and a lot of you reject it. <sighs> I don't know about that part. Listen, you stuck on white man Jesus. Goodbye for you. Because you can't be delivered with a mindset that's stuck on the white man. You got to humble down and repent and do what the scriptures say. Read that again. For the husband is the head of the wife. And this ain't hatred because they go, oh, they hate women. Right. They're woman bashing. Oh, no, 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 sister. You got it twisted. Don't get us twisted with the Christian church. Understand that. Read it again. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Even as, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now, there's something written there. That I don't think you all see it yet. Read the whole verse again. I'm going to see who picked up on it. For the husband is the head of the wife. Even no, so often wives submit yourselves. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Mm. Even as, even as. What is being said there, even as? Marriage is even as the church. 
Marriage represents the nation of Israel with Christ as the head. Marriage represents Christ and Israel, Christ and the church. The word church is Greek. All it means is assembly, congregation. Read it again. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. Now let's get to the point. Jump down to 27. Verse 27. That he might present it to himself. That he might present it. What is the it? The marriage. He's presenting your marriage in Christ. The Lord wants to present your marriage. Read it again. That he might present it to himself a glorious church. A glorious church. Not having spot or wrinkle. Not having spot or wrinkle. What's the spot or wrinkle? Sin. Spot or wrinkle that's in your marriage must... What do you, when you get a spot in your clothes, what do you do? You wash that spot to get out the spot. When you got wrinkles in your clothes, what do you do? You get that iron. You iron it out. Okay, you iron out what? So what are you ironing? You're ironing out the problems in your marriage. You're washing out the spots in your relationship. Read it again. Not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, mm -hmm. but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. As their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. He that loves his wife loves himself. Come on. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it. So now, brothers, the Bible is teaching you, it's teaching us, that we got to love our wives the same way we love our own bodies. What does that mean? You nurture yourself, you eat, you drink, you brush your hair, you brush your teeth, you wash, you bathe, you try to look nice, you try to dress yourself, you take care of your responsibilities. For you. Read that again. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. So that same way, you got to do that for your wife. That's what the Bible commands you, okay? Even as Christ did it for the church, okay? Because how did, how did Christ deal with us? Yes, he taught us the scriptures, okay? He nourished, he fed thousands, the multitudes with the, with the fish, with the, the bread, okay? He paid Peter's taxes. He healed the sick. He raised the, he did all these things. Read it again. For no man ever hated his own flesh, but nourished and cherished it, even as the Lord, the church. Even as the Lord did with Israel, the church. Come on, what verse you at? Verse 30. Go ahead. For we are members of his body, mm -hmm. of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. For this cause, meaning for this reason, shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall be joined unto his wife. And shall be joined unto his wife. So you brothers, stop right there. You brothers that live at home with your mama your daddy and your so-called wife live down, down the street with her mama, her daddy, guess what? You're out of order. You are out of order. Understand that. That's just a booty call you got going on. There's an old worldly expression. Why buy the cow when you get the milk for free? Meaning, why would a brother marry a woman if she was giving up the booty for free? So you sisters are talking about, oh, my husband, he lived with his mama. No, that ain't your husband. Okay, that's your booty call. Read it again. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother. For this cause shall a man leave his father and his mother. And shall be joined unto his wife. What does it mean be joined to his wife? Meaning take her as yours. Read. And they too shall be one flesh. You two come together in one mind. What verse you at? That was 31. Go ahead. This is a great mystery. Now marriage is a great mystery. A lot of you don't understand it. Read it again. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. What does that mean? That marriage represents Christ and the nation of Israel. That's what it represents. So you brothers, you sisters that say you repent, you got to get your minds right. You coming into a marriage, understand what the marriage represents, okay? So now, from there, let's go to Ecclesiasticus and the Apocrypha. We want verse tw chapter 25. We're going to read verse 18 to 20. Ecclesiasticus 25, verse 18 to 20. Ecclesiasticus chapter 25, verse 18. Her husband shall sit among his neighbors, and when he heareth it, shall sigh bitterly. Now, you don't want to be in a marriage like that. When your, knife, when your wife's name comes up, you sighing bitterly. There have been brothers and sisters amongst us who had to be put out the congregation. Why? Because the wife got to a level of such wickedness that when the brother heard his name, his wife's name, he's like, oh gosh, my wife again? Yes, brother, your wife did such and such again. 
Your wife said this level of evil again and again. Read it again. Her husband shall sit among his neighbors, and when he heareth it, shall sigh bitterly. Come on. All wickedness is but little to the wickedness of a woman. So, sister, you don't want to be like this. The Bible says all wickedness is but little compared to the wickedness of a woman. Because a wicked woman will do you dirty. A wicked woman, is that's that woman that says, oh, yeah, you did this. I'm going to sleep with your best friend. Yeah, mm -hmm, Tyrone, I have my eye on Tyrone. I'm going to go do something with him. Mm -hmm. Then she come home and tell you, I had your friend. I did this to you. Okay? That's a wicked woman evil woman. She's the kind of woman that will embarrass you. She'll go to a party, get drunk, hop on a table, lift her skirt, pull down her, if she wearing pants, whatever she's doing, and embarrass the hell out of the husband. Read it again. All wickedness is but little to the wickedness of a woman. Come on. Let the portion of a sinner fall upon Let her. Let the portion of a sinner fall upon her. What's the, what, we just went down to 20. As a climbing up a sandy way is Watch to this, the watch this, read it again. As a climbing up a sandy way is to the feet of the age. You got an age man trying to climb up a sandbank. It's hard, it's hard to do. It's hard for the old man to climb up the sandbank. Read. So is a wife full of words to a quiet man. That's compared to a wife full of words. She won't shut the hell up. The quiet man's at home and she's, I got, I got, I got. The Bible says that's like an old man trying to climb up a sandbank. It's hard to do. You can't endure it. What verse you read down to? That was 20. Down, okay, from there. Let's go to, stay right, go to the next chapter, Ecclesiastes 26 now. We want 14 to 16. Ecclesiastes chapter 26, verse 14. I'm just dealing with the marriage right now still. Go ahead. A silent and loving woman. Uh-oh, here's the flip side, sister. See, never think that we woman bash. Never think that, but sister... If you're out of order, we going to, our job is to tell you you're out of order, okay? Same with the brother. Brother, we don't man bash. <laughs> but if you're out of order, our job is to tell you you're out of order. Now let's get the flip side with a woman. Read it again. A silent and loving woman is a gift of the Lord. Mm, you see that? A quiet and loving woman is a gift from the Lord. So sister, are you that gift or are you that big mouth, know-it-all woman? Hmm? The choice is yours. Read it again. A silent and loving woman is a gift of the Lord. Mm. And there is nothing so much worse as a mind well instructed. And now not only is she quiet and loving, her mind is well instructed in what? The laws of the Most High, the Bible. She knows the scriptures. She knows what to, how to apply the laws of God. You can't compare nothing to a woman like that. Read. A shamefaced and faithful woman is a double grace. A shamefaced and faithful woman? Is a double grace. Is a double grace. Brother, that's what you want out of a wife. You want a shamefaced woman. She ain't all up in a nigga's face talking about, I'll tell you what I want to tell you. That's not a shamefaced woman. A shamefaced woman is that woman that is humble. She keeps her head down a little bit. She's like, yes, brother. Yes, she got that spirit on her of a woman, okay? She ain't trying to be equal with the man. She definitely ain't trying to dominate him. She, know, she understands that how the Lord has created her. Come on. A shamefaced and faithful woman is a double grace. That's a double grace. And her continent mind cannot be valued. You can't value a mind, a, con a continent mind, meaning what? She understands the scripture. She's applying the laws. What verse was that? That was 15. Come on. As the sun when it arises in the high heaven, so is the beauty of a good wife in ordering of her house. Read that again. As the sun when it arises in As the high the heaven. As the sun when it arises in the high heaven. So is the beauty of a good wife. So is the beauty of a good wife. In the ordering of her house. In the ordering of her house. Because she understands her role. She's going to take care of her, her home where she lives. She's going to make sure it looks nice. She's going to make sure when that man comes home from a hard day of work, there's food prepared for him. She's looking out for him. He might have, he might come home mad as hell. She's going to say, let me run you some water, baby. You're going to tell, I'm going to put some oil in the bag. I'm going to take, I'm going to make you rest your mind. Here's a couple, oh, uh, uh, might be a little glass of wine. She got some nice, she know what to do to calm that man's spirit. She ain't going to be, ah, no, nigga, you left your socks on the floor, nigga. I told you about that. Now both of y'all bumping heads in the house and you writing us letters. What do I do? Learn to be a wife. Learn to be a woman. Okay? Stop trying to be a man. What verse you at? That was 16. You finished 16? Yeah. Jump down to verse 28. Verse 28, there be two things that grieve my heart. There be two things, it says? 
Two things that grieve my there be heart. two things that grieve the Lord's mind. Come on. And the third maketh me angry. And the third maketh the Lord pissed off. Come on. A man of war that suffereth poverty. A man of war that suffereth poverty. This is a brother that's going out to war. He never reaps the benefits. Come on. And men of understanding that are not set by. You got brothers like ourselves who have understanding of the scriptures and you at home don't support this truth. We're not set by. Go ahead. And one that returneth from righteousness to sin. That's the thing that makes the Lord angry. One that returns from righteousness unto sin. Why? Because you're going through your trials and all of that. And you I, I, I'm giving up this Bible so I can't take it. And you go back to the world where you were at. Back to your old sins. The most I said he hates that. That was 28. And one that returneth from righteousness to sin. The Lord prepares such and one for the sword. Now, let's go to Colossians chapter 3. Let's deal with that third level now. Let's deal with the congregation level. Because the Lord said in Psalms 133, how beautiful it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. So you go from your personal trial, because now you try, you as an individual, you want to get your life right. Okay? Now that you're getting your life right, you say, you know what? I want to be married. I want a wife, okay? Or the wife says, I want a husband. You Now it's the two of you trying to get together, trying to learn one another in the laws of the Most High. Now from there, then the two of you say, you know what? Let's be around other brothers and sisters that believe like we believe in these scriptures, that we are Israelites and must keep the commandments. So you join a body of believers, okay? That becomes the congregation. That becomes the church, okay? Now Colossians 3 and 12. Colossians chapter 3, verse 12. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved bowels of mercy, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering. You see what you got to put on when you come into the truth? Read on. Forbearing one another. We got to forbear one another, put up with one another, deal with one another, be patient with one another. And forgiving one another. And we got to come to the level where we are forgiving one another. Because from your marriage, you got a husband, you got to learn to forgive your wife if she errors. Wife, you got to learn to forgive your husband. Now you come into a body of believers. You're going to meet that brother. You're going to meet that sister who might get on your last nerve. But you got to learn to forgive. Come on. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. So you got to learn to forgive. What verse is that? That was 13. Come on. And above all these things. And above all these things. Put on charity. You got to put on charity. Charity means what? Loving your neighbor as you love yourself. Come on. Which is the bond of perfectness. Which is the bond of perfectness. All we went down to is 16. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also ye are called in one body. Stop right there. Now, I, I want it down to 14. I'm sorry. Let's go to 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We want verse 6 through 11. Okay? We're still dealing with that congregation. Okay? The congregation of believers. That nation of Israel. 2 Corinthians 2, we want 6 through 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Come on. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment. Listen good. Now, I'm going to sum it up for you. You in 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 6, right? Three verse 6. Go ahead, read it again. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment, which was inflicted of many. Now, when you read this, Paul is making reference to 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Hold this. Go to 1 Corinthians 5, come on. Chapter 5, and I want verse 1. 1 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Read. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. Sexual immorality. And such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So this brother in Corinth was having sex with his stepmother. Jump down to, I think around verse 10 or 11, where it says, put him out. Uh, but now I write unto you, not to keep, this is verse 11. But now I write, I, but now I have written unto you not to keep company if any man that is called a brother be a fornicator. So if any brother in the congregation, not to keep company if he's called what? A fornicator mm -hmm. or covetous, covetous or an idolater, idolater or a railer, a railer or a drunkard or a drunkard or an extortioner, an extortioner with such as one know not to eat. Don't eat with brothers or sisters that got those attributes. Read. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? I have nothing to do to judge those outside the truth. Read. Do not ye judge them that are within? You brothers, when you come into a congregation, it's your job to judge those within the congregation. Read. But them that are without, but God those, judge it. Those outside the truth, the Lord, let the Lord deal with them. Read. Therefore, put away wicked from among yourselves. Read that again. Therefore, 
Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So in the congregation, when there's unrepentant sin, they got to go. Okay? Now go back to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, what verse was that? Verse 7 now. No, 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6 again. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. What is Paul making reference to? That brother that was put out for having sex with his stepmother. He never repented, but here in the second chapter of 2 Corinthians, this man has repented. This is years later now. Go ahead. So that the contrary wise, he ought rather to forgive him forgive the man, and comfort him, comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Come on. Wherefore I beseech you, that ye would confirm your love towards him. Mm -hmm. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether ye be obedient in all things. Obedient even to the point of forgiveness. Read. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave it in the person of Christ. What verse is that? That was 10. Go ahead. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us. Right, Satan can get an advantage of you if you don't forgive. Go ahead. For we are not ignorant of his devices. Now, let's go to Acts 20, verse 28 to 30. Acts chapter 20. Because that's dealing with the congregation, okay? And this is what Paul warned us about in Acts 20, verse 28 to 30. Read that. Acts 20, verse 28. Mm -hmm. Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves, and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers. So you brothers, you're the overseers. You men are the overseers. Just like in your house, your house is an, the church is an extension of your house. You men are the overseers. You're the leaders. Read. To feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So your job is to feed the church of God with the laws of the Most High. Read. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you. So Paul warned you. He said after his departure, there would grievous wolves enter amongst the congregation. Read. Not sparing the flock. They wouldn't spare the flock, flocks, the followers of Christ. Read. Also of your own selves. Paul said, even of your own selves, you overseers, you leaders, watch one another. Because some of you might get the devil on you. Read. Also of your own selves shall men arise speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. That's their purpose, to draw away disciples after themselves. Go ahead. Therefore watch and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn everyone night and day with tears. So, brothers and sisters, I pray that you got some understanding out of today's lesson. Visit our website at www.israelunite.org. We have a list of activities when you go to our homepage, all right? You can see what we've been up to. We're going to constantly be updating the webpage. If you want more videos, visit www.youtube.com slash Nathaniel7. And brothers, sisters, please send your donations. We need your financial support. We cannot do it on our own, all right? And with that, Israel, we give all praises to the Most High and His Son, Jesus the Christ, and we say Shalom. Shalom, Israel. For a copy of this show and all other shows, please visit our website at OriginalRoyalty.com.